So there are things we know and things we don't know. For weeks, the Russians and the Chinese have been alleging that the U.S. has been working with the Ukrainians to create bioweapons labs that can be very dangerous, that have very dangerous pathogens. Most people, at least that I know, including myself, paid little attention to that because they were just claims without evidence from the Russian and Chinese governments that obviously deserve a great amount of skepticism and shouldn't be believed absent evidence, which was lacking. The issue really became uh, a significant issue when Victoria Nuland, who is the Under Secretary of State and has been basically running Ukraine for the United States since at least Hillary Clinton's State Department, went before the Senate and was asked by Marco Rubio, I'm sure you guys have covered it, does Ukraine have biological and chemical weapons programs? And she didn't say no. She referred to these research facilities, biological research facilities, which she said are so dangerous, she's worried they're going to fall into Russian hands. This is what we know for sure, that they do have, Ukraine does, biological research facilities that contain seriously dangerous pathogens that can easily be weaponized if they're not already. This is what Tulsi Gabbard was talking about yesterday when she raised the concern by saying, we know for certain there are these labs in Ukraine that have these dangerous pathogens and haven't been secured and was criticizing the U.S. and Ukrainian governments for not having secured them in light of the Russian invasion. And she was widely called a traitor, including by Mitt Romney and many other members of the media for having done so. And I think, Ravi, you touched on the key point, which is that we are at the point which we always arrive at in war, where most members of the corporate media simply take U.S. government assertions or denials and treat them as unquestioned truth. And I've been quote unquote fact checking these concerns as false based on nothing more than what the U.S. government has been telling them. And that's always dangerous. I don't know how many times we have to learn that lesson. And there was an interesting exchange between uh, Sean Hannity and I think Jennifer Griffin at Fox News where she kind of pushed back on him and said, no, 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 Sean, but what you're, you're misunderstanding what Victoria Newland said. What, what she means is that we are winding down kind of Soviet era labs f from the 2000s. Uh, and th and but what I don't quite get is why they would why that takes 15 or 20 years. So have you have you looked into that further this this pushback to Victoria Newland's testimony that actually these are just Soviet era labs that we're winding down and cleaning up. Is there anything to that what 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 do we know about the research that's being done. So it, just let's use common sense for a moment. Aside from the intuitively absurd notion that it would take 15 to 20 years for the United States with all of its resources and all of its dedication to shut down some Soviet era labs. 15 years it would take to secure and shut down those labs. That seems highly improbable. The more important point, though, is that it doesn't square. You can't reconcile it, that claim of the U.S. government that Jennifer Griffin dutifully mimicked with what Victoria Newland said, because if they're Soviet era weapons programs, and there are Soviet era chemical and biological weapons programs in these former Soviet republics that the United States has been trying to secure, that is true. Why would you be concerned that they would fall into the hands of Russia if they were Soviet era programs? It stands to reason, doesn't it, that Russia, the capital of the Soviet Union, the kind of command and control base of it, would already have those materials. You wouldn't need to worry about them falling into the hands. What is happening here is clear to me, Ryan, which is the United States plays this semantic game, which is they absolutely do develop biological and chemical weapons. We know that for sure. The FBI says the anthrax attacks in 2001, which remember were highly sophisticated weaponized strains of anthrax, came from a U.S. Army lab, part of the infectious disease complex in the United States that a U.S. Army scientist unleashed on U.S. soil. We know that the U.S. government, based on reporting by your news outlet, also was helping to fund in China experiments to make the various coronaviruses more lethal and more contagious. These are biological weapons. The argument, though, of the U.S. government is, no, as long as we're developing these weapons for the purpose of studying them and developing vaccines for them, they don't count as weapons. They only become biological weapons when your intention is to use them offensively. But they're still the same thing. So even by the U.S. government's own acknowledgement of what's in Ukraine, and you can look at Reuters articles about the World Health Organization saying the U.S. has been funding various programs like this in Ukraine 
the, when they say they're not biological weapons programs, they're just playing that semantic game. Clearly, they're concerned, they say, that the materials are going to fall into Russian hands and the Russians can weaponize them. Look, I think that a lot of what passes for leftist liberal culture today is essentially economic privilege masquerading as morality. You saw this with the COVID lockdowns, you know, people who could afford to work from home from white collar jobs, dress that up as some sort of moral high ground. You saw it with defund the police, people who live in safe neighborhoods who never need the police were able to dress up that economic privilege as morality. You see it with a lot of the environmental because yes, the Keystone Pipeline, that would have been 14,000 union jobs that got wiped off the map in, you know, the stroke of a pen. And now you're seeing it with, you know, gas prices. You know, inflation started long before this war. And essentially what liberal elites have done is found a way to blame inflation on working class Americans who can't afford it, who can't afford these gas prices. Now they're saying, oh, you don't care enough about Ukraine, right? It's it's again this this move of taking economic privilege people who can afford to pay more for gas people who drive electric cars right and dressing that up as morality at the expense of the working class right and it's that kind of attitude that the liberal elites have where they're saying oh, you have to say i'm sacrificing we we got to sacrifice but sacrifice doesn't mean as much coming from you as it means to people who when they fill up and gas costs as much as it does right now, that makes a, a meaningful difference to them because maybe they have less money for food or for housing or for something else. It is absolutely maddening to hear millionaires saying, we are in this together, we need to sacrifice. Who's we? You know, you are not in a we with a struggling working class who's making 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year who can't afford to pay six, seven dollars, you know, a gallon for gas. That that means they're going to have to choose between taking their kid to soccer practice and going to church on Sunday. Right. There's no we there. And yet that imposition of economic privilege as morality, getting high off of being rich and acting like that makes you a better person. So much of liberal culture is, is, is caught up in that. Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of celebrities that have been have been uh, pushing this. I think Tom Hanks was one, which was uh, kind of disappointing to see. And there have been a number of, of uh, rich celebrities coming out being like, well, this is our duty, you know, because we're at war, which we're not even at war. But um, also the mainstream media has been pushing this, as you've been mentioning about this. Oh, well, you'll pay more because it's helping the people of Ukraine. Bette Midler is another one. She tweeted out this photo of a Ukrainian toddler and said, I'll happily pay more gas for her. And you actually talked about this when you are on Bill Maher's show, so let's take a listen to that. This is class warfare right. masquerading as vanity morals. It's the right. morals of the elites, and who has to pay the price? It's the working class. It's the guy. It's, it's on the front. Mm -hmm. You know, That's, they say, no, oh, you're, you're, oh, they're no, going to buy electric cars. It's like it's no, like the let them eat cake of no, 2020, right? Let them drive electric cars, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, Bacha, really good points here. It's interesting to see how inflation has clearly been increasing at a rapid rate for months now, months and months and months. And now suddenly there's an excuse and it's Ukraine, it's, it's Russia, right? Russia's the problem why this month, or I think February was 7.9% inflation, the month before it was 7.5%, and it's just gone up and up and up and up, and it was even before there was actually a war going on. Do you think, because I'm a little suspicious, do you think that one of the reasons why we're even pushing Ukraine to continue battling Russia, rather than negotiate with their nucle nuclear neighbor, rather than saying you guys need to go to the table because it is not a good idea to be enemies with a country right up on your border that has nukes. Uh, do you think that we're kind of pushing this a little bit in order to have this excuse so that the Biden administration can say, well, it's not, uh, once they realized it wasn't transitory inflation, it's not whatever it is the problem that really is, but it's instead Putin's problem. So I, I don't think that that's the case because I think that Biden has shown a lot of willpower standing up to the kind of elites that are trying to get him to escalate even further. So I totally agree with you that we have not been pushing negotiations enough. President Zelensky last week already said that he would be willing to give up um, his request to join NATO, which was essentially Putin's number one reason for entering this war, this horrible war, inexcusable, but that was the reason for it. And that was something that he has 
stated very explicitly is the main thing that would make him stop the war. So I don't think we have been doing enough to convince the two sides to come together, especially given how little distance there is now between them and how well the negotiations are going at this late stage. At the same time, there is so much pressure from American elites on both sides of the political aisle to escalate, escalate, escalate. And I have been actually very impressed with how Biden has resisted that. Um, so I think that that, that um, I see why you would make that argument, um, but I, I don't see it that way. What I do think is happening is it's become very, very clear that um, the environmental causes at stake here are in deep tension with the working class. Now, that doesn't mean that environmentalism isn't important. It doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening and isn't something that we have to really do our best to take care of and to and to mitigate. But the, the Green New Deal, a lot of the stuff bound up in the environmental lobby is coming at the expense of the working class, both in terms of jobs and in terms of energy prices. I saw on Twitter, and I assume they're referring to the same story, but it might be a different New York Times story. Michael Isakoff of uh, Yahoo News tweeted a screenshot of the Times story. I think it's this story and saying, oh, I didn't see in the category of didn't see this coming, the New York Times has confirmed the authenticity of the Hunter Biden emails derived from his laptop that were previously dismissed as Russian disinformation. Ah. The Times is finally confirming those? I, yeah, it's confirmed. They, I, I didn't know the Times had pretended that they didn't they were not know confirmed. those were right. confirmed. <laughs> right. But this I, uh, story confirmed I, I responded them. with a gif of the Pokemon Slowpoke. Right. So, okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, thank you, New York Times. Uh, it's been clear for a very long time. It's clear from like yeah. day three. It, it was, <laughs> yes, it was clear even pr like prior to the election, it was clear. Yeah. Because- No, it was clear on day you could, They didn't refute it. <laughs> they, a, they didn't refute it, but you could, you know, and I spoke to some people uh, who were on the other end of emails who were like, yeah, okay, that's, that, is, that is my email. Mm -hmm. um, and you had, you know, Bob Alinsky and others like saying like, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm on these emails. Here's my end of the email. These are not fabricated. So, yeah, but that's interesting that the Times is now. Yeah saying that so now we're allowed to believe it there you go and talk about it freely without being censored right, right. <laughs> that's the way it goes another conspiracy theory that's not a conspiracy theory yeah they went all out on that you know they they really did like new york post wasn't allowed to tweet yeah for a, lo a while wasn't it you literally like two weeks. it was the most egregious the example link. of tech censorship until what happened to us yeah. <laughs> That's right. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. And then, and then what happened to us, which is really bad. tough. Just it. kidding. I'm just, yeah. No, it was, a, it was a bad, bad call. Uh, I mean, it was so bad the platforms admitted it was a bad call, right? <laughs> they, right. Facebook and Twitter both said in, uh, in appearances before Congress that, yeah, they got that one wrong. That was a bad call. Uh, it was beyond a bad call because it ultimately, you know, that it is in a way, what are they, I mean, I hate to, I'm trying to not say the word, but election interference in a way, right? So it is. It's well, that's bit, why they, yeah, that's why they had, you know, fallen on their sword yeah. over it. Because, you know, do we know how it would have influenced people's votes? Like, is there, is there somebody who switched their votes? We, we, we genuinely don't know because it didn't. Well, happen. but my, my suspicion is the way Twitter and Facebook tweeted that story actually made it made yes, people this. more likely to read it. Uh, it was totally a Streisand effect scenario. I, like I, it, it, right. I think so, that then there were the side hundreds of, the aisle, of articles wrong. about how the truth was being hidden from right, you. Exactly. Right. And it, like, yes. they made it sound more, uh, uh, they made it sound even worse for Democrats right. because now the Democrats' allies in the media are actively working against you finding out about this. Right. Because what they had done so, in the past was just not covered at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they'd have done that, it would have gotten less coverage than if they had right. censored it. Right. It took on this, this oh, yeah. the, you know, the bombshell that is being hidden from you, the, the you know, the, the one that totally changes everything. So. But the problem it, is, is that only conservatives really were paying attention to that. I, every liberal I spoke to said, no, that's fake news. That's not real. That's a conspiracy. That's Russian disinformation. But and I don't believe But that. if they hadn't, if they just, if they'd not done, if they'd not censored it, I don't see how that would have been different. I think just fewer people would have right. known about it or been outraged about it. Right. Because the people who are going to be persuaded that it's not real because big tech and the media is censoring it, we're never voting for Trump anyway. Right. Those are like loyal Democratic partisans at that point. It's similar to how James Comey, right before the election, did a press conference saying, we looked through all the emails yep. and we found nothing new. And all of the, all of the analysis afterwards showed that that, that actually boosted Trump. Mm -hmm because people were outraged, didn't believe it, it, it and it invigorated Trump supporters and the, the Clinton supporters were like, well, we, we didn't, A, we didn't care about this, B, we didn't believe there was anything going on anyway, so it didn't do anything on that, but it actually boosted. So I, I could see a similar effect on this.